stream restoration and setting up a breeding program of endangered Colorado greenback cutthroat trout. We hope that um, eventually we'll be able to have a program up there where um, they'll have a breeding population which then can introduce uh, greenbacks to other uh, watersheds in Colorado. Right now, it, it, it has gone down to one watershed, and so it'll be great to have um, a real breeding program of those. And of course, there's all kinds of um, complicated overhead there too, but uh, <coughs> we really think that there's a good opportunity that that'll happen at the um, west end of the valley there. Um, a whole list of things that we need to celebrate. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, um, oh, I know another thing that um, we are planning on and hoping to do and that we have in motion is that um, our forest has been kind of let go for a lot of years. So we're working with the National Resource Conservation Service um, to um, have a thinning program, and the first line of that will be to help protect all our structures down there, all those 100 year old wood structures. This, is, this building is over 100. Um, and one of the things that we really like that we hope will happen there is that we'll work with um, the Cheyennes and the Rapos and the Comanches um, to provide them with some lodge poles from our abundant supply of by the bull pines, which will be a nice part of that idea of thinning, uh, thinning out the forest, uh, which is, um, you know, if, if any of the world has received lessons this year, it would be pay attention to the fire, guys. <laughs> and so that, that'll be um, another thing I think to celebrate. Um, so, um, since this is a school, and since we um, are having class here uh, for the first time in a very long time, uh, the first thing that we want to do is have a book report, because that's what you do in school, right? And so Travis and Kate Wright have written a couple of books about this immediate area, and this is not the original widescreen TV, but um, it is, I think that's a, something else new to the schoolhouse, this, this, this device. Provide electricity. Uh, well, um, yeah, so that's another credit to Pete Schmidtmann because he and his crew, a number of whom are here, and whom we appreciate their long work, um, is to actually put in wiring fix this amazing floor, replace all those broken windows, build us some shutters so that hopefully these won't get broken. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a lot of celebration and congratulations there. So that, with that, um, Travis will tell us about some of their research. Thank you so much, Wolfie. Uh, well, thank you. There is a lot of love that was put into this building. Thank you all for being here to celebrate uh, what has happened here long ago and what the next chapter of this story is to become. This presentation is Toland as Trunyan. So this really is a valley that changed the American story. It changed American history. And we'll look at that as we go through over the next 20 minutes. So I'll take you all through a brief excursion through time. We'll look at Rollins Pass, which is just right back here, as a great gate. We'll, of course, look at perhaps the most famous chapter of the Rollins Pass story, the Moffat Road that went over Rollins Pass. We'll look at the Moffat Tunnel on the west end of the valley. And we'll come back here home to Toland and look at how history echoes itself. So my name is Travis. I'm the vice chair of the Gilpin County Historic Preservation Commission. And in Grand County, where I live, I'm president of the board of directors of the Grand County Historical Association. 
My wife, Kate, and I have done a lot of research with Rollins Pass. We have no photos of hanging light or maroon bellets, but Rollins Pass, we have a little bit of info for you. Lots of academic research and publications. We've given presentations all across Colorado. We've written two publications in 2018, and our latest, present, uh, our latest uh, book came out just two months ago uh, in May. We've also found the oldest human-made artifact ever discovered on Rollins Pass. It clocks in at 11,000 years ago. And it's appropriate that we found it here because Rollins Pass has been identified as a sacred area for both the Ute as well as for the Arapaho. And that little piece of stone, while it's important, this one's important to me too. Last month, I was given the State Honor Award from Colorado Preservation Inc. at the Dana Crawford and State Honor Award ceremony for protecting the western portion of Rollins Pass. The literal entrance to the western portion was being considered for property development. The Forest Service was con considering a trade with the developer. I stepped in, got involved, along with so many other agencies, from Colorado Preservation Inc., the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the state archeologists, we banded together and collapsed that land exchange before it could occur. <laughs> So I'd like to look at Rollins Pass as a great gate. So the historian Marshall Sprague once spoke about the mountain passes serving as great gates, funneling humans and animals from one side to the other. And Rollins Pass absolutely fits the definition of a great gate. Whether you call it Rollins Pass, Corona Pass, Boulder Pass, or even Rollinsville Pass, we're speaking about the same area, at least for the purposes of today's presentation. Rollins Pass sits squarely on the Continental Divide, and is shared among Grand, Boulder, and Gilpin counties. It's located uh, uh, east of Winter Park, west of Rollinsville, and we are right here, that green star, that's Colon, Colorado. <laughs> I define Rollins Pass more or less by these geographical boundaries, contained within thousands and thousands of years of use by Paleo-Indian and Native Americans. But it wasn't until the 1860s, 1870s, when John Quincy Adams Rollins built his toll wagon road up and over the Continental Divide and into Middle Park. It just starts right out here. And in 1880, there were early attempts at running rails over, over the Divide. Those met with failure, but did succeed in changing the landscape just a bit in a few key areas. And it wasn't until 1904 when David Moffat built his squiggly Denver Northwestern and Pacific Railway hill route into modern day Winter Park. <laughs> Obviously a bit inefficient, which was why in 1928, the Moffat Tunnel opened under a shoulder of James Peak, much more efficient. So you have a tunnel for rail traffic, you have a tunnel for water to flow to the front range, and on the wall of the rail tunnel, there's fiber optic communications, beginning to change the definition of what a great gate can look like in the 21st century. It's no longer animals and humans, but also pulses of light uh, that carry communications. Then in 1936, the rails were removed over the pass, freeing the automobile to travel two decades later in 1956. The route is no longer a complete thoroughfare, so what you see there in green is the current extent today. Then in 1948, we have the highest rotating airway beacon in North America, beacon number 82. This was for guiding primitive airline traffic over the divide. In 1969, we have a natural gas pipeline that stretches from Grand and Boulder counties. It's actually still there, it's still in use today. Running north to south and south to north, we have the Continental Divide Trail of the Americas. And then over all of this, we have an en route airway radial known as V8. And because it's four nautical miles on either side of that center line for airline traffic, it looks more like this. So Rollins Pass really is that great gate that historians brought spoke of. We also have two wilderness areas. To the north, the Indian Peaks Wilderness, and to the south, the James Peak Wilderness. So that is a look at Rollins Pass. Perhaps the most well-known chapter, of course, the Moffat Road over Rollins Pass. This is footage from 100 years ago, 1922, from the White Desert. This didn't make it into movie theaters until 1925. But it shows trains lumbering up that snowy divide. <coughs> Is that on Netflix? <laughs> Just exceptional footage. 
So taking you all on an imaginary train ride today to the summit of the pass, we get on at the Tolan Depot, just a, just a little bit that way. We board the train, and our goal is to climb first Giant's Ladder. You can see three distinct levels of track enabling the train to continue to build elevation as it circled those mountains, as it was attempting to cross the Continental Divide. That's where we're going next. Here's a look at the first leg of Giant's Ladder. We have track hanging on a mountainside, quite literally. And to the right, gorgeous Toland, timeless Toland. As we gain a little bit more elevation, we get a different look at Toland. This is a, somewhat of a rare image. But one thing I'd like to point out to you is this structure here on the extreme right. This is the Toland Roundhouse. We know for a fact that this image was not taken in 1910. There's no snow, so it was likely taken in 1909 or earlier. And we know that because Tuesday night, April 12, 1910, fire completely consumed that roundhouse. It was completely destroyed by fire. And a few days later, uh, the uh, Yamba leader talks about that the railroad saw thousands of dollars of damage. But there's optimism there that the roundhouse will be rebuilt later that June. This is some of the research that I've done for the Gilpin County Historic Preservation Commission. And you can see, I just love these, these old images. That is the roundhouse up top. A few years later, the roundhouse is gone and it looks like charred remains there. And just to put a fine point on it, a roundhouse need not be round. That is a roundhouse in Wisconsin. It's a three-stall roundhouse. The one in Toland was two. But uh, it's a mostly square slash rectangular building. And they did keep their promise. This is a Railroad map from 1919 that does show the roundhouse in that exact same location, so they did rebuild it. So we're climbing up that third leg of Giant's Ladder now. You can really see <laughs> the steepness of this road, and that steepness has a fuel toll on it as well. From Rollinsville to Corona at the top of Rollins Pass, our, our train, this imaginary one is uh, emission free, but back in the day, 16 to 20 tons of coal would be burned. And it's burned to power impressive machinery. Trains are heavy. Rotaries attached to trains add quite a bit of weight. We're going to go through snow sheds that kept snow from accumulating on the tracks, impeding the progress of the trains. And when there weren't snow sheds, Avalanches would sometimes take hold. You can see this train stuck in an avalanche, much like an almond in a white chocolate bar. And these uh, cars in the background weren't so lucky. They didn't stay on the tracks. So derailments were a big problem as well. And even when there wasn't snow, derailments were a big problem. This rock, ill-timed, but it's a uh, derail number 302 as well as it's scheduled for the day. Can you imagine this headache, especially because on the other side, it's a couple hundred foot drop. Uh, so, precarious situation in this image, uh, this story did not make it into the newspaper articles. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the men had a great sense of humor. <laughs> and that's what I really want to highlight with some of the remaining pictures, is that human story. These photographs are more than 100 years old, but they still speak to us as if they were taken just uh, a few days ago. And they were no different than us. That's the point I'd like to really highlight, is that uh, if we were born just a little bit earlier, this would have been our story as well. So they're no different. Telegraph your friends from Corona, the highest railway station in the world. We Instagram, we Facebook, we email, we call our friends with our portable telegraph machines in our pockets. Really, uh, really need to see history come full circle. They were into off-roading, just like many people are as well. Uh, a top pass. But you can really see in these images just the camaraderie that these railroad, railroad workers had because they had to have each other's backs in such perilous conditions, particularly in winter. Their saying was that there's winter and then there's August. So there was a lot of snow and ice that they had to contend with. But ultimately, we find ourselves at the summit of Rollins Pass at the town of Corona, where tourists are assembling for a photograph on eternal snowfields. These snowfields persist June, July, August, even into September. And next to those snowfields, abundant wildflowers and incredible views. That is what's drawn people for millennia. So the next chapter of the Tolan story is the Moffat Tunnel, located just a few miles uh, to the west of us, 1923 to 1928. 
you saw in the earlier photographs, derailments, avalanches. There were a lot of headaches, which is why the Moffat Tunnel was absolutely needed. It's just a straight shot through the tunnel, 12 to 15 minutes in complete darkness, and there's no thunderstorms uh, inside James Peak. It's quite efficient. Uh, the tunnel is 94 years old as of this year. It was actually crucial to winning World War II, and I'll talk about that here in just a moment. Um, but uh, absolutely incredible. And again, if we were born a little earlier, this footage was taken in East Portal. love this from the National Archives, really neat stuff. So some interesting facts about the Moffat Tunnel. A lot of drilling took place here. Uh, 400 tons of steel uh, or drill bits to make 700 miles of drill holes. It's only a 6.2 mile long tunnel. Uh, so that's a lot of drilling and a lot of blasting, 1,250 tons of dynamite used to construct the tunnel. And all of that rock that was excavated, 750,000 cubic yards. So if you were to load that onto trains, you'd need 1,600 freight trains, each 40 cars long, to cart all of that rock away. Just exceptional statistics. And slowly and surely, from blueprint to pouring the foundation and beginning to frame up the East Portal ventilation plant, beginning to complete the arch that would stand over trains for more than almost a century now, and crowning it with an American flag for the truly unique achievement that it was, the Moffat Tunnel opens in 1928, and newspaper articles, because newspapers were even delayed with Rollins Pass, they didn't hold back, Corona is abandoned, it goes without regrets. <laughs> So we have work cabins at either side uh, of the Moffat Tunnel for construction purposes. There were hundreds of families that lived at West Portal and at East Portal. West Portal has disappeared with time. East Portal, there's only five remaining cabins and they still exist today. And they have been listed as one of Colorado's most endangered places. And they were crucial for World War II as well. So they were construction cabins uh, back in the day but in World War II, they were housing for military sentries who guarded the entrance of the tunnel. This uh, US Forest Service photograph was taken just a few days after the formal surrender of Japan in World War II, and uh, it just shows uh, just how well preserved that area was and still is today. And crucial to winning World War II, more than 30 defense trains hurried through the tunnel each day, and that's in addition to the freight and passenger trains that went through as well. So as we bring it all home, this is the chapter on Toland. So this is Main Street of Toland. Uh, really exceptional, but one building I'd like to pay particular attention to is on the far left of the screen. This is a University of Colorado structure. This is known as the Bug House. And here are uh, students as well as professors sitting outside that Bug House. And I just love how history comes full circle because Colorado State University just last week, just right out here, uh, conducted a bio blitz. They were studying flora and fauna, much like they did a long time ago here. These are some of those photographs from just last week. A look at inside the bug house, looking through microscopes, and there's uh, textbooks on the table. Studying is obviously important. This is a valley full of knowledge and, and uh, understanding of the natural world. And again, last week, just out here in Toland. Beautiful wildflowers. These are photos from Tristan Anderley. Just exceptional, just carpets the entire valley. But we've seen this before. These ladies collecting wildflowers before their train excursion on Rollins Pass a century ago. And an interesting find with this bio blitz that was conducted last week, there's more than 200 plus acres of Carex oreocaris. This is a sedge. I'm not a plant person. Sedges have edges. Grasses are flat, so these are kind of an edged looking grass, if you will. Uh, it's actually the largest occurrence in Colorado, perhaps the largest in the world. We don't know that for sure, but it's found right out here. And Toland, this schoolhouse, it seems to have always been here. 
of course it needed to be constructed, but it persists in photographs from long ago in winter, change seasons, it's always a permanent fixture here, and it will be given the love that has been put into this building. And Toland itself, as a, as a landscape, has inspired so many paintings of the valley that have made it onto postcards, and then these postcards sent all around the world. To early photographs, I'll admit this photograph isn't very good, but I included it because at one point it meant something to someone, they took it for a reason, and they were trying to capture the beauty that is Toland. Idyllic scenes, this photograph also made it into a postcard, but a lady enjoying time with her dog on the lake. And the view shed hasn't changed. Fast forward to today. And what remains today has been true since the beginning of time. This area beckons the visitor because it is both wondrous and extraordinary. And it's changed because of the Toll family. The Toll family have been crucial in altering, quite literally, the course of history here. This is Catherine Toll. Her husband, uh, Charles Hansen Toll, he was a mining attorney. He was also uh, Colorado, one of Colorado's attorney general at the time. He bought this entire area for $1,000 long ago. And his intent was to actually dam the South Boulder Creek, make this into a reservoir so we'd be underwater right now. But he died suddenly at age 51. And Catherine Toll decided to sell off small parcels uh, for homes, for recreational purposes in the summertime. And of course, Wolfie Toll and other members of the Toll family who decided that this area is worth protecting, it's worth defending. These view sheds are timeless and they need to be preserved for future generations. In this valley, it's gorgeous, it takes your breath away. And in fact, the Toll and Ranch Conservation Easement is one of the largest intact holdings, uh, private holdings along the Front Range. It's crucial to protecting drinking water for both Denver and Boulder recreational opportunities, and so many others. So for that, the Toll family continues to have a, an incredible influence on this valley. So I've taken you across Roman Pass, taken you inside the Moffat Tunnel, and talked about the East Portal Camp cabins, how this area was crucial to winning World War II. I've taken you everywhere but inside this schoolhouse. And I have no knowledge about what happened in here long ago, but for, for that, I'll pass the microphone over to Margaret. Thank you so much.
These are uh, Margaret's slides, and she brought them over to us. And there were 132 of them. So Molly and I um, did some editing, but we showed them to Margaret, and she still thinks they're okay. Her dad um, had a whole text that went with it, and that we looked at a lot. Um, so this is kind of our selection from Margaret's much larger collection, but um, Margaret is this infinite source of information about Totem, and so it's wonderful to have her here. And as we've been saying, the whole Romali tradition here is awesome. with the 
creeks wandering around the way that it was. So at that point, they decided to channel it up. It was channeled earlier down below the bridge, which goes into the Sonic Coast property. That is Charles Hampton Holt, Wilkie's grandfather. Great-grandfather. Great-grandfather, yes. And he was born in New York, and his father was a farmer. And he wanted his son to go into farming, but his son was more interested in law. So he went to college. And then he worked with one of the judges in New York and was granted his law degree from the New York Supreme Court. That's how they did it. Well, then he decided to come west. And when he came west, the first place he stopped was Cheyenne. And he decided that Cheyenne very much fit its name as the wildest, most obnoxious city in the West. <laughs> so he said, okay, enough, I'll go to Denver. So he came to Denver. But when he got to Denver, what he discovered was there was lots of attorneys in Denver, too many. So then he went to Pueblo. And from Pueblo, he went west and ended up in Del Norte. And he was very interested in the area over there because a lot of it in the San Juan Mountains was Indian reservation. But he said that the white people were rapidly encroaching. And so he settled there and loved the mountains. And he was um, appointed county attorney, after which he became a uh, legislator. And then eventually he was the Attorney General for Colorado. And that's how he ended up in Denver. And then he stayed in that position for two years. And after that, he was through with all. He had it. <laughs> now this is a picture of Wilkie's great-grandmother, Catherine Cole, and the four, the four boys. And now I'm not sure whether I have them in the right order, but I think the one on the left, it's either Charles or Roger. And there were Charles, Roger, or Henry and the, Henry. Henry is the sort of tall one towards the middle. Right, and Oliver the is the short one. Oliver. Oh, yes. The and Roger's on the left, and Carl is on the right. Okay. Now this is taken from, it was a town that had actually three names. You could call it either Sled Town, Rag Town, or Benson. And it, it was located at the foot of the valley, down, now where uh, Benson goes up. And that was the, for the building of the railroad. It had already come through Rollinsville and was at the foot of the valley. And that's another picture, and as you can see, they had lots of salute. <laughs> and this is one of the uh, boarding houses. You can see how wonderful they were. <laughs> the bed's 35 cents a night, or if you put two people in it, it was 50 cents. Now this shows the grading of the road through the valley and it, um, Wolfie's great-grandmother, Catherine, is standing on the left watching it. And the interesting part about that was this was all done by horse. The horse mule, all of that, because there was no way to get any of the larger equipment that they had to be able to all the other railroads. You could not get it up here in the valley. So they did the whole thing that way. Ah, and this is Charles Toll. This was the first real estate office. They formed the Toll Investment Company, and he was put in charge of selling the lots in the property. And that, um, I'm not sure whether that's a part of the house that is now 
the uh, caretaker's house or not? Do you know, Wilkie? I don't know. I don't either, but I know that um, it was probably located in that same area, whether that was torn down and they built a better one or not, I don't know. Yeah, uh, this, this shows all of the plots. They had the town plotted in Gilpin County in uh, 1906. And on here is a list of all of the people who built the original houses in Tolman. And I think the interesting thing for me, looking at that, is I actually did know some of those people. <laughs> but yes, when you've been here for 80 years, yeah. So, yes. Now this is the original house of Captain Tolman. She had this built, it's across the valley, and it's, it's a very nice house. Uh, it has wonderful views, and it's still there, and the Haas family lives in it now. It was, uh, well, now this is, this is a story my father told me. <laughs> there was a, a gentleman named Ed Bader, and he liked to build saloons. This was his thing. And so he built a saloon up over there behind where her house is. And Mrs. Toll did not like that. She was very much against liquor. Toll was a dry town. And so Dad said you that. You can tell by all the saloons, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that was the end of the valley, you yeah. understand. That was off the road. <laughs> so Dad said she did not want to be that near the saloon. So she leased the house to a miner, his name was John Anderson. And eventually she bought it. And they built a house in, uh, they had some friends, the Bromsteads. They were Norwegian. And they had some friends, the Bromsteads, that liked to come up and visit. So they gave them three acres across Jenny Creek. And they built a little house over there, and it's still there. Now that's the inside of Maui. No, no, that's, no, no. that's cabin. Oh, you're right, that is. That's uh, the inside of the original house. Uh, now we get to the town. And it's, um, when I was little, the building on the very far right is the school house. And it was being run by George Mosh. And then next to it, the next taller building is the Tolan Hotel. And it was still being used at that time. And that was, was good, had that. And then next to come on to the Ohio House, which was there courtesy of some of the Reed relatives. The Jeffords. And then you next to that is the the Foley cabin. Mr. Foley was a very interesting gentleman. He was a shoemaker. And he actually made the shoes, totally made them. He started out in Rollinsville, and then when Tolan became a bigger town in Rollinsville, he moved up to Tolan. And there's a a lake that's named for him down in the horse pasture called Shoemaker's Lake. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of stories about how it got the name. One of them was that uh, he had gone over to Baltimore, which was not a dry town, and had a few too many over with the Hatfields. And when he was walking back, he got lost and wandered through Shoemaker's Lake, <coughs> which I don't know that he had a name before that. So when he arrived home, he told his wife that there had been a horrible storm and he had to get through it. And then the other story was that he was, the, a biblical story, that he had decided 
that he could walk on water. <laughs> so he had been able to actually walk through the lake without drowning. The lake to this day is the, to this day is known as Shoemaker's Lake. Now this is when they were first building um, the town. And on the right is the dance pavilion. They had a, the railroad put out the dance pavilion and an eating house. The railroad was anticipating all those excursion trains that came because they ran excursion trains not only to Poland, but also up to Corona. And lots of companies in the Denver area would schedule on the weekends these enormous excursions and all these people would come up and be in the, in the valley, wandering around, picking flowers, fishing, doing all kinds of things. It was very popular. And the kids, my father was one of them, what they used to do when they found out there was a nice excursion train coming, they would dress up in their, what they called their go to town clothes. And so they would go over there and mingle with all these people that came up in the hopes that they would be able to get some food. And they really enjoyed it when they could come up and um, they had all different kinds of things that they did. In fact, there, there were um, burros, donkeys, that were pastured here in the summer by the sheep herders that took sheep up on the divide. And during the time when they weren't being used to haul up supplies, what the kids would do is they would catch them on a day when there was an excursion train, and then they would offer them to the people on it for a certain price. So they made money off the donkeys too. <laughs> and they also picked flowers, because they said some of the people that went to Corona, they didn't want to pick the flowers before they went up, because they would be wilted before they got back to Denver. So they would go around and pick large bouquets of flowers, have them ready and stand by the train when the train came down, and sell the flowers. They were, they were very ingenious. And the other thing they did was they had comfort stations for all the people that came, which are now our porta potties. And um, sometimes they would get dumped over. And uh, sometimes they were dumped over. <laughs> and the kids then would go over to the station and talk to the station manager, and he would pay them to go back and run to the station. So they, they had several different ways of earning money. They were very ingenious. Now this is a picture again of the town of Poland, and on the left is the Toll Hotel. That's the one. It started out being the Mariposa Hotel. It was um, built. Wilkie, do you remember this? I know it burned down in 1910. Yeah. Yes, 1910. That's when they burned down. And, uh, yeah, on December 17th, I think. Mm -hmm. And anyway, that was quite a uh, hotel. It had a settling light. It had indoor plumbing. It was very, very nice. And a lot of people used it. And um, then on the right side, kind of in the middle, the picture that has the round helio, that was the dance hall. And they had dances there every weekend. But this was a very, very social, ongoing place. They were very busy doing all kinds of interesting things. And eventually, they put glass in those because the, the, the um, people that came up didn't really appreciate the wind. And Toland is known for its wind. So they glassed the wind so that they wouldn't get blown away. And that's another picture of town. And again, you can see the dance pavilions on the left. The Toll in is in the background, and then the next building is, at that point, it was the Rice Building, which later became the building that my grandfather used. 
and I don't have to, well, I should tell you the story of Mr. Rice. He was a very interesting, very enterprising gentleman, too. Um, he apparently followed the, the railroad when it was being built, and when it got to Rollinsville, or just before it got to Rollinsville, he built a store there. And as soon as the railroad went through and moved on, he left that store, and then he came out and built a store at Vincent. And as soon as the railroad passed that and came up into the valley, he built that store at Tolbert. And then as soon as the railroad went over the top and got to Arrow, he left that store and went to Arrow. Now, where he went after that, I don't know. <laughs> and this is a picture of all the um, people that came up on those excursions in the summer. They would have, I don't know how many train cars they had tapped. They usually had more than one train. Because they would have up to five, six hundred people wow. that came up. And um, they, they were big excursions, extremely large. Okay. Now, I have no idea what happened to that flagpole or anything about it. Yes, it certainly is. And again, the building on the right is the Children's Hotel, which um, was actually built by Sarah McHenry. She was a lady who came out west with her children, and they still live in Baltimore. And then um, her daughter, Elizabeth, Mr. Hatfield in, in Baltimore, was very enterprising. <laughs> he had several saloons. And when the federal government discovered that he not only had the saloon, but was the postmaster. They said, no. <laughs> you need to make a choice. <laughs> well, he made the choice according to his pocket because the federal government was paying $15 a month salary to the postmaster. And so at that point, Elizabeth and Henry became the postmaster at Baltimore. The um, people in Baltimore had really thought that the railroad was going to come close enough to them that they would be the main city in the valley. And uh, Mr. Hatfield was going to name the town Hatfield. And of course, that did not work out. But um, then when the post office moved, it was moved from Baltimore to Mammoth, which is the name for Tolan before it became Tolan. Um, <coughs> the Henry's moved over and they built the, uh, the stores. Now this is a picture again of the, um, those are some of the cottages in Tolan that um, Catherine Tolan built several colleges that were used, uh, cottages that were used for um, some uh, people did not stay up here in the winter unless they had to. <laughs> so, and then you can see the, the water tower. The water tower was always fascinating to the kids. And uh, one day, the, some of the kids got extremely dirty. And uh, Bruce Clifton told them that they needed to go take a bath. So what they did is they went down and talked to the uh, railroad personnel that were in charge of the water tower and they turned the water tower on and gave them a good shower. <laughs> <laughs> now this is the, this was done by my father, and this was put up on the 75th anniversary of passenger trains coming to Tolman. And he had the, he put the mama sign there and the Tolman sign. Actually, we say the name wrong. It should not be Tolan. It should be Tolan. No. <laughs> <laughs> and this goes back to Maurice's great grandmother. Her family historically came from Tolan, England. But then you go there. And then to Tolan. Yeah. And then went to Tolan. Actually, when I was young, 
Most of the people up here were still calling me Tom. I can remember my uncles never, never said Tom. It was always Tom, but I always remember him as Tom. And that's a picture of the Tom. And it was really a shame that that burned down. The night it burned down, the hero or the heroine of the day was
to get her degree. She got a degree in, degree in elocution, and I had no idea what that was. <laughs> anyway, she came back with that degree so that she was the first teacher that taught in this school. And she had 14 students in the first class. And the um, interesting thing about the, uh, how the school was run, they had what they would call a school term. And the school term could be anything from two months to nine months. And they all changed. And during the time that this building was being used as a school, there were 14 different school teachers who were here. And the school teachers were very popular because they were all unmarried. At that time, you could not be a school teacher if you were married. And so uh, Bertha McHenry married Ed Evans, who was one of the store teachers in town, and she did it on the swamp because she wanted to stay as a teacher. And so uh, she did. No one knew that knew of the marriage for quite a while. Are there any school records? No, they were all the only ones my dad was they were all gone. Now, that one I do know who the people are. The teacher is Effie Sledge. This is the summer of 1916. And the second person is my father. He was six years old. And the others in there were, um, it was Richard Bright. Neil, somebody they don't, dad did not remember his last name. My uncle, Uncle Ed, there was um, Bill Young, who they lived in the, uh, what is now the Lightning House. And then there were these two Clifton boys. There was uh, Robert and Richard Clifton. Now they, as normal children, they decided that they needed to uh, give Effie a fairly teaching name, so they called him Sledgehammer. Although, Dad said they all really liked her. She was a very popular teacher. And one day when the well would not function, the older boys decided they would go over to the Meadow Creek and get a bucket of water and bring it over for the school. Well, in those days, they had specific times that you better be in the school or you were late and you were not charged. Okay, well the time came when they were supposed to be in the classroom and they were struggling with this bucket of water. So Effie stood out in front and kept ringing the school bell until they all got back with this bucket of water and got in the building and there were no charging departments. <laughs> And there's another picture of the school house. Now this is the, well, what we would call the new school house. It was built in 1921. They, um, they soon discovered with this school house that it was just not practical to use it in the winter. It worked out beautifully in the summer, but in the winter it was too cold, too windy, and you just couldn't use it. And the reason they decided to build the schoolhouse in this area was simply because they had a lot of students that were coming from Jenkinsville, Mammoth, and Tolan. And what they wanted to do was to have a location that they felt was fairly simple so that it was not a burden on any of them to be able to come. Well, by the time the other that school was um, constructed, they had discovered that this, this was not a wise choice except for summer school. They did have lots of summer schools here. And then um, a friend of my father's, Robert Clifton, <coughs> whose uh, parent, or parent owned the Tolan Hotel, bemoaned the fact when they built that school that now he would have to go to school for nine months of the year. And he had enjoyed it 
previous to that, because there were times when uh, he was the only student, and they would have classes in the houses, various different houses in town during the, during the winter. Uh, now that is the University of Colorado Mountain Biology Lab. And there's a, that was the man in the right. Now there, we have uh, two professors that were there, and my grandfather is the one in the middle not wearing a hat. <laughs> and the other is Dr. Caldwell and Dr. Bethel. And this is the inside. Uh, my grandfather decided well, he talked to the regents at the University of Colorado in 1908 and requested that they consider a summer biology building because this, I mean, you have all different zones here. You have the plain zone, and you have the montane, which we're in, then you have the subalpine, and then you have the alpine. And this would be wonderful to study flowers, birds, bugs, frogs, salamanders, whatever, and this is one of the classes. They wanted all over everywhere up here. But he picked the location at Poland because of the train. It made very easy access for people to get here. Not only was it easy for them to get here, but it was easy to go through all the zones. So you could be here in the morning and up in the alpine by noon. Here they are over here. Butterfly net. <laughs> yes, I have to tell you that the um, well, people in the town called the village, the rice village, the bug house, and they called, they didn't have biology here, they taught bugology. <laughs> and my grandfather would have called frogs for mailing because on there, they have very many gatherings on the weekends with lots of the towns people and some of the people that came up on these excursions. And one of the things they like to do was have him get up and give a talk on the various frogs in the valley, which he enjoyed doing. And he had somehow mastered the talent that he could imitate every one of these frogs and frogs. And so he would give a demonstration of all the various frogs and folks. And my dad said he didn't think that they ever let my grandfather know they called him frog. So I <laughs> Now this is my house. And this was very unique when it was built. It was built in 1910. And everybody in town said that my grandfather was crazy. I mean, you know, somebody who imitates frogs and teaches biology, and he goes to build a house which is totally different from anything else ever built in the valley. It's a cement stucco house. And it has a corrugated iron roof. And they all said, oh, next year it'll be gone. It will not survive the winter. That's what that is just it's <coughs> not gonna happen. The other good thing that it has, which is very beneficial up here, is a complete cement foundation. So we do not have this rat battle. We have mice once in a while, but we don't have the rat battle. And the reason my grandfather chose this was as a young child in uh, Minneapolis, his house had burned to the ground. And he was very, very concerned about fire. And that's why the house was built the way that it is. Even the, the um, parts around the windows, those are metal. Those are not wood. And so um, I'm sure he would be surprised. Well, I don't know that he would be surprised that it's still standing. But it is still there, and it's pretty much exactly the same, although I'm not the only cement stucco house in the valley any longer. The Giles Toll family has it. Okay, where's that? Um, it's down, do you know where the Golightly house is? Yeah. I'm right next to them in the woods. Okay. Yeah, it's the one that's down 
I would imagine you might be able to see the lights if we have all the outside lights on. Okay. Yes. Christmas time? Uh, <laughs> I left that up to candle light and put lights in the front of okay. <laughs> Now this is Melody. And um, the porch is still there, but the windows are not in this picture. They're windows I, uh, by the chimney. And somewhere I have a picture. Well, and we were discussing this the other day with the people on the scaffolding when they were working on the house. And so this is the house that grandmother built to get away from that nasty liquor. But you know the funny thing, the other funny thing about it was they moved over to that side of the valley too. And then they got a saloon. Yes, a little bit. To the east and south of Malwick. However, um, she took them to court and got them out. <laughs> and at, at that point, well, it, it was probably before that, in any deed that was given to all the property in Tolman, there is a clause in the deed that says you cannot sell liquor on this property. If you do, the property will revert back to the Charles Toll investment. So we watch Margaret very closely. <laughs> <laughs> and it is definitely on the deed. When I got the deed to the property from after my father passed away, I checked. <laughs> and it is there. Oh, this is one of our characters. There were many, many characters up in this valley. It would just be impossible uh, to name all of them. But this is uh, George Monch. He was an, a miner, and he came over from Prussia because he did not want to be enlisted in the army. So he came over here and became a miner. And um, his, we have actually no history on his wife, Elizabeth, except he called her mother. And when he came over here, it was long before the town of Tolan existed. And he built a house up, up beyond East Point. It's If you know where the um, eastern Arapaho Creek is, it is just a little bit below that and off to the left of the trail. And you can actually still see some of the remnants of it. How in the world they lived up there with four children, I don't know. So I meant to mention I meant to mention George at the beginning because George assigned lots of different functions to himself, like the oh, chat. But I was gonna say that in the fine George Mosh tradition, I'm naming myself the principal at least for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. No, he was he was very interesting because he did lots of mining. And um, eventually he ended up running the pool hall in Tolman. And then at the just before he died, he was down at the house that was closest east in one of the Golden houses. And uh, he was the last one that was up here. And he used to say when he went down to the hospital the last time, he said, Well now now Tolman is truly a ghost town, I'm the ghost. And there was some, when my father and my uncles were young, and they were up in, uh, the marshes were up in town, I remember that uh, dad said, they used to go up to get ice cream cones from them. And at the time, my uncle Francis was quite small, and Mr. Marsh would delve out the ice cream and give all the, the three bigger boys a nice big cone. And then he'd give <coughs> Uncle Francis very tiny one, because that was for the baby. And of course, that did not go over well with my Uncle Francis, because <laughs> could certainly be the only big as his brother. <laughs> and I remember them because of um, when I was young, we would go and visit, and Mrs. Mosh ironed with an iron that she heated on the stove. And I was utterly fascinated with that iron. I had never seen anything like that. And it was just, I loved 
just bought the visitor just to watch her ironing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, iron. And then uh, one thing that Mr. Marsh always did, the town well was still there and still had a pump. And he used to have us go out and uh, supposedly for him, the drill for us was to pump the well for them to get the water to come out. Now this is their daughter, Elsie. And Elsie was actually born in that cabin up west of East Florida. And there have been rumors and stories for years that the space on the Walden floor in Central City was her face. Whether that's true or not, nobody knows her. And um, she, she had a very difficult time. She ended up, she had uh, lung cancer. And Which is not surprising because I lived right next to Elsie down there in town. And she would have her oxygen and she would still be smoking. She smoked a That she did. And she, for years she uh, was an elevator, an elevator operator in Denver. And one of the buildings in Denver. But when she got older, she came back up. She told him. And at first she, um, was after the, well, all of her father and mother's things were burned with the big fire that happened in 1955. The whole cabin departed. And she had a trailer there that she was in for a while. And then there were some houses that would be below the Clifton house, if anyone know where the Clifton house is. Um, there were cottages that were built there for some people. And she stayed in one of those for several years. And then she worked out a deal with, I don't know whether it was um, your father or your grandfather that she worked out the deal with and got her property up in town, which is in back of the uh, cabin far enough. And um, she came up there and lived there all year round until she passed away. Now here we are back to the park lake. And you can see how the creek used to run. It ambles around everywhere. One of the favorite things is well. Sorry, sorry no. Ah, now we come to the people across the valley. <laughs> this, these are the Sarlingos. There were two, two brothers, Charles and George. And they, they were Italian, and they came over and took over. First they were at the Dora, which is one of the stops on the Mocha Road. They took over the, um, I think it was the Gilbert Motor Company, or the, uh, either that or the Jenkins McKay had lumber operations up there. And they took that over, and they ran the sawmill up there and provided timber for, oh, many things in the town. Also, um, for the, some for the Mocha Tunnel. So the next picture is what you that's the door. We have the curved crescent there that is very fascinating for us all gone. And the interesting thing about the Zarlingo brothers is each one of them had nine children. And <laughs> during the summers, the children would come up and they would all stay at the door. And the winter they went down to the Denver. <laughs> and so um, one of the things they used to say on the train that they looked forward to was that when they baked their bread every week, they would come up and they could smell this wonderful bread baking because they had an outdoor oven and they, they didn't sell the bread or anything, but everybody, you know, just the smell, the guys were just so crazy. <laughs> And then, of course, when the tunnel was completed, this is no longer a viable operation. 
So they moved down to where they are now and did the logging up Jenny Creek. And um, I think I told a couple of you today that I actually knew Charles when I was a senior. When I was very small, about three years old, my um, mother and father and my brother and I were going to walk up Jenny Creek up to what's now called um, Dead Man's Gulch. And the uh, lumber mill was operating at the time, and Papa Salvengo was there. And he saw us walking by because the, there was a locked gate, you couldn't drive up. And he saw us walking by and he came out and he said, no, 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 she's too small to walk there. This is not going to happen. And my dad said, well, you know, you can't drive through this. The gate, he said, no problem, I will take care of it. So he went over and unlocked the gate. And off we went. And then he said, in the future, I want you to know that in this truck, there was this old wreck of a truck. He put a key so that Dad could open the gate and so that I did not have to walk up to Dead Man's Hill. And I always remember how nice he was that day. And this is the post fire one. It's a little hard to see, but this is, I, I believe, it's after the town burn. Yes. It's after the 1950. Right, because you can still see the school town. And there were some buildings, the uh, small cottages that Catherine had built to. There were lots and lots of people. They came up here just for the summer. They came from all over everywhere. They come from Texas, from Kansas, from back east. And sometimes they repeated. And they had the cottages in Poland that were there. And then um, there were several of them in Baltimore, too. And of course, Eldora. At one point, the thing that amazed me was actually probably in about 1904 or 5, Eldora had between 500 and 600 people living in it. And you know, it's, if you look at something like this, it's hard to imagine how there could have been that many people in that space. But I think that the one interesting thing that I learned in going through all of the slides and all the information was how resilient these people were. You would hear about them in the winter. They would be holding a dance over at Apex. Well, to get over at Apex, you got to go clear up over Cross Mammoth Gulch. They would. Some of them would walk. Some of them had a sleigh. Uh, they had dinners, parties, dances in all of these various and sundry houses around here. And they were very active socially, summer and winter. So it was. Uh, I think that's the last one. I think that is. Well, thank you all for coming.
and labor and grandfather. <laughs> and I just think about it. And it was that, I, I don't know what time of year it was, but I, we lived next door to each other and I was watching television. And all of a sudden, the town boat, our boat was burned out. And I ran over next door and they wouldn't believe me. It was on television. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I remember I used to get to go into the pool hall when I was about five. Uh, and then right about then, she was done. Yeah. Uh, how did your great grandmother allow a pool hall in the room? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm sure it was dry. <laughs> 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 Without cutting the fence. 